I have started and exited multiple companies. I am an avid investor in early stage companies. I advise some of the hottest startups and have worked with many of the top tech companies across numerous industries. I'm a software developer by trade, but I also have an MBA from Duke University. I seek out companies who defy conventional wisdom to drive innovation in any industry. And in this podcast, I interview the founders of those companies for you. Uh, Hello, folks, and thank you for listening to the podcast. I'm very excited to do this interview. I have Linda Nash, a serial entrepreneur who has started and successfully exited three businesses and is now running her fourth one. It's called Welcome MD. Uh, Normally, I would be super excited to chat with someone of her stature, but given the current climate and the global pandemic and the fact that her clinics are treating COVID patients, I think today is going to be an extra special episode. Uh, We're doing this as a webinar, so for the first time in Defiance Ventures podcast history, we will be live, and we'll also take a Q&A session at the end of the program. Um, So folks out there joining by Zoom will be able to to queue up some Q&A questions, um, probably more for Linda, but if you have any for me, I'm happy to try to answer them as well. I will also make the audio available on my podcast and the video on my YouTube channel, so please make sure to subscribe to both of those if you haven't already. Uh, Linda, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule, and thank you for what uh, you and your colleagues are all doing for us. Um, it's easy to take people in the medical profession for granted, uh, but I think we all realize the sacrifices you are making to literally hold our society together during a very challenging time. Thank you. I'm really honored to be here, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Great. So can you tell the listeners what Welcome MD is? Yes, Welcome MD with two L's is a concierge medical company that I created to really be the next generation of concierge. I was, I'm a serial entrepreneur, as you mentioned, and I had another medical company also concierge, and we did a great job. But when I exited from that, I really wanted to see what people now in 2020 or really 2017 when we started we're looking for and i found it was a little different everyone wants access to their doctor their doctor's cell phone no waiting that type of thing but what people were looking for was something deeper and something more integrative they wanted to really understand all the systems of their body and how they worked so we have teamed up with two amazing anti-aging regenerative medicine physicians, added two more wonderful physicians. And what we're trying to do is look at aging and optimal aging, really, there's no such thing as anti-aging, and the body and lifestyle and health in a whole different way. And it's been very, very well received so far. And I'm having a great time because I learn something every single day. That's awesome. So it's much more about being proactive rather than reactive, I guess you would say. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Part of that is the numbers. We only have 300 patients per doctor, whereas my old company, which was fantastic as well, Partner MD, has 600, and that's more than norm in concierge. So it's like anything else. If you have double the time, you can really be proactive, build in follow-ups, build in phone calls, build in checking on labs and really getting deeper when you're discussing people's health versus reacting when they're sick, which of course is also part of taking care of people. Great. Now I've heard the term concierge and executive medicine often used interchangeably. Um, First of all, is there a difference between the two or do you think of the two differently or is it really two sides of the same coin? Um, It's a little different. So executive health really is driven by the leaders of a company. They have done the research and decided that they want their top executives to really get a thorough checkup that's very preventative in the sense of looking at heart risk factors, stress factors, all the things that take down type A personalities in their prime, and they invest in that. And Our program, and there are other great ones out there as well, really has to do with 
giving a super thorough look at the entire executive and not just the biology, but we do a stress profile to see how the interaction of community, friends, lifestyle, work, and the balance of all that interacts in terms of the whole human being, which really impacts your health. When you work all the time and don't feel you're being a great husband or wife or parent or friend, it's really hard to achieve optimal health because those stress factors can influence what, what you do. So I've, we have really had some wonderful reactions among the community in Charlotte and in Richmond to this and have some great clients now who are enjoying really looking at that. Um, they can also opt for the membership or not. That's up to the company. So that's where it becomes more concierge-like. The whole day is very concierge, but then they can go back to their primary care or they can opt for a very nominal fee to stay a member and get that continued care. Now, why would they have both, the, the more traditional family practice as well as the, the concierge or executive doctor? Most times, they, after spending a day with one of our docs, they choose to come over. But it's the unknown, the devil you know versus the devil you don't know. And a lot of times people want to stick with their primary care, but they really, because the company pays for it, want that real good checkup. Although what we've found is we can be so much more effective if they come all the way over so that once we make recommendations and we give them a full list of doctor recommendations, we can also then follow up and coach and help and use our nutritionist, exercise physiologist, health coach to really hone in on, on the changes. So you can do also everything that a primary care physician would, would provide typically? Absolutely. Our okay. physicians are primary care physicians as okay. well as having these specialties. Very interesting. And so one of the things that a lot of us have heard in the news, whether it's correct or not, is hard to say, but we've heard that healthier people generally are faring better with in, in, in a COVID world on those who yes. do contract it or generally perceive to, to handle it better. Do, do your patients and prospects seem to be hearing that message and are they thinking more about somebody with a more preventative, integrative approach such as your practice? That's a great question. I don't know that there's been a definitive study out there, but there have been a lot of studies about immunity and um, health in general. One of the biggest studies, there was a, a Harvard article that I can post for you later, but it talks about regular exercise and being really good about eating and lifestyle issues and how people get less of the chronic diseases such as heart disease and diabetes, obesity, things that can influence your reaction to COVID. The better your immune system, the more the cells flow through your body, um, the immunity keeps up. And when you kind of don't use all of those tools at your disposal, it is much easier to get, to get the disease. Now, of course, there are immunocompromised people who do everything within their power and they're still going to get it. And some really healthy people will get it, but it's all about the odds. And it's all about once you get it, how difficult is it to fight and how strong are you? Great, and if you can share those, any links to any of those studies uh, with me, I'd be happy to post them on the, on, on the show notes because that, that's, that's interesting stuff to me for sure and I think for the listeners as well. Love to. So it sounds like the belief is that preventative medicine would change the prognosis for someone getting COVID or on the severity of the symptoms and their overall risk? Yes, I think that and having a health partner that you can talk with immediately. Part mm -hmm. of what we've all seen in the news is that when someone thinks they have it, it's hard to find a test. It's hard to distinguish between that and allergies. It's hard to figure out when is this serious and when isn't it. And so putting both the preventative piece and the ability to communicate in real time with a provider who can get back to you and get you solutions is a pretty powerful 
prescription, so to speak, to, to fight this thing. I, I can imagine. I've, I've got a friend who had some symptoms after coming back from New York and mm. he, you know, he, the, the bad part for him was that he, it, it took a while to convince the doctor that he needed a test. They were pretty certain he needed it. And then the test results were lost four days later. Mm. And then by the time he finally tests, he's, he tests negative, but, and now he's trying to find an antibody test. And I think that's the hardest part about this pandemic for everybody is just the lack of good information. Yeah. So I can see why having a doctor, a, a, a network of doctors that are informed and speaking in real time would be very helpful during this time of uncertainty. We're so nimble at, because we're a small company that we were among the very first in Richmond to have the tests and we and we've used a few we've had a couple co positive cases but we get the results back within 24 hours and i know other folks at least in virginia are waiting 8 days to get it back and that's not real helpful in terms of making decisions as to what you're doing and we just um, received the antibody test in charlotte and richmond so we'll be using that as well um, we tested our first patient for the antibodies last week and retested her for the COVID. So it's, it's interesting. It's all about data and we can't mm -hmm. get the data if we don't have access to the tests. And we were able to get them because we have good relationships with our labs and they work really hard to help our members um, get satisfaction. That's great. And just for the listeners who, who may or may not know the antibody test, and maybe I don't know, maybe I'm misinformed, but my understanding is that's a test that says your body has beaten the COVID virus and these are the antibodies that, that remain afterwards. Do we feel those tests that we have are pretty accurate at this point? Or? Not accurate enough. Um, mm -hmm. They're a piece of information. I just had that conversation with our medical director Friday, but we're st we still want to do it. It's a, it's a, pinprick on your finger and even if they're 60 percent accurate it still gives you some good information and um, the problem is they're not approved by the fda yet because the fda can't get all these things approved in time and there haven't been enough testing on them but preliminary data shows that they're they're really important especially for people, especially in conjunction with retesting. So if you mm -hmm. retest and you, and, and you get negative after having it, and then you get the antibody, you're, those are two indications that you're pretty good to go. And I would imagine the reason this is important is because if we didn't know upfront that you had it, it's, we want, we still want to know it's the denominator in, in our right. equation, right? It, it exactly. tells us how many people have had it. Okay. Got it. Yes. Exactly. And how many people can go back to work and feel more comfortable seeing their family or any of the things we're all trying to figure out on a daily basis? Yep, absolutely. So I want to go back. You talked about this integrative approach to medicine. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, there's multiple factors that I try and stay in front of. And I'd love to get you to speak a little bit to how you think about trying to balance these factors off of one another. For me, important things are diet, sleep, stress management, fitness and exercise, taking supplements where necessary, mindfulness. And what I lately think of as the mental diet, kind of the food we feed our brains. Um, mm -hmm. I, I feel like to me, the, the days when I balance those well, I, I just feel better. I can't really quantify why, but how do, you, how do you think about going, like how important are those different factors and how interrelated are they in your mind? I think they're incredibly interrelated. I mean, again, the science about the endorphins that come when you work out regularly. On the days I do really intense workouts, I can handle some of the other stresses a lot easier. Because of what we do with the really intensely curated labs, we can look at cortisol levels, stress levels, hormone levels, all those things that we can see that kind of imbalance us in terms of stressors. And so our physicians can recommend supplements to people that may help. They can certainly recommend mindfulness, exercise plans, diets, but it all goes hand in hand. Um, I really think it's important. You brought up a great point about kind of the mental diet 
And at first, because this was coming at us so fast, I'm probably like a lot of people, I was just reading about it constantly and thinking about it and talking about it. And now I'm trying to measure it out into sort of little chunks of time where I can absorb it. And then I try to move on and do something really productive with my business, with my life, and then move back to where I can absorb it because I think we all feel such powerlessness in the, in the scale and the scope of this pandemic. It's like nothing any of us have ever seen. And that in itself is stressful. Feeling like you don't have control over something is extremely stressful. So I personally have been working out more than ever. Um, my husband and I try to get up to the mountains, the Blue Ridge one day a week and hike safely, not on crowded trails, but um, do eight, eight miles, seven or eight miles of pretty steep. And um, I just feel that it helps me mentally so much. And I really recommend that for anybody who can, who can do that. It just helps you deal with everything else as a business person and a parent and a community member that you're dealing with here. Absolutely. And on the mental diet front, just anecdotally, you know, I, I'd like to turn the news on and see the statistics. And But I, what I've found is that if I spend more than five to 10 minutes a day on the more traditional news outlets, I just, I don't get much from it. But I, I attended a webinar that two of your doctors uh, put on uh, mm -hmm. last week. And it was so much more informative. And I've listened to a couple of podcasts with Dr. Uh, Peter Hotez and a couple mm. of others. And, and I just think that, I think in general, we're seeing a lot of trends in digital technology that were already underway long before COVID, but I think that they're, they're, they're pushing forward. And personally, I think that the more digital forms of media have, have become a lot more useful to me, even more so than prior to the pandemic. I agree. It's, it's, amazing how many of the stories just repeat the same stuff over and over and you just mm -hmm. you're kind of like enough i can't absorb this <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah you, you can have a 24-hour news cycle but you can't have 24 hours of news that's for sure even during a right. pandemic <laughs> right that's true great so i'd like to shift gears a bit and just mm -hmm. talk about about your history um this isn't your first rodeo, as, as I've alluded to. You've done this multiple times. First off, congratulations. It's really hard to build one successful business, and, and you've done it now uh, four times. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Can, can you walk us through your career progression leading up to, to, to where you are today, maybe starting with undergrad or even earlier, if there was something really influential there? Sure. Um, I guess the biggest thing is I come from an entrepreneurial family. My, I have a family business that still exists that started before I was born. It's a track and field magazine called Track and Field News, and my dad published it. Um, he was a serial entrepreneur, published it. We do tours to the Olympic Games, which sadly are now postponed for a year. But it's all about the sport. And I grew up watching my dad and mom work in the business, and they were just really happy and independent and excited to be building that business. We didn't get rich from it, but we had a really good secure life. And I loved the idea of, of doing my own thing at some point. So I, um, when I graduated, I decided to, I was a journalist for a couple of years, and then I became a writing teacher and a journalism teacher, which I really loved. My, I married my husband. We moved to Virginia from California because he had a job at University of Richmond. And I started teaching and I, for many reasons, loved the kids, got a lot of awards, loved doing the student newspaper, but the structure, just I did not like the structure. And you interview founders and entrepreneurs, and you're very entrepreneurial, and you know none of us really like to be terribly structured in a given day. <laughs> so I started my first company long, long time ago, 1980, wow. and it was a workplace childcare company that developed into... Um, first, it was for after school. Then I partnered with hospitals to do infant care. And I ended up with five locations here and in Northern Virginia and sold them to a 
public company in the 90s um, for more, you know, at, at this point, it wasn't a lot of money, but at that point, it was more money than I ever thought I would make because I had my teacher mentality, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was so excited and um, started another company called the Compass Schools. And how long um, was it between selling the first one and starting the second one? Uh, about six months, four wow. months. Okay. Um, some people in town approached me and um, basically decided to back me doing an Italian curriculum. We opened in Northern Virginia and the Midwest, three states in the Midwest, and the schools are still there. They have great reputations. And it's a Reggio Emilia curriculum with a artist in residence and the kids do projects and make things. It's really exciting stuff. And I did that, um, sold my part of that to my partners because they were great guys, but they're cousins and I was a third and they were a third and I just wanted something where I could drive it a little more. So from there, I was looking around for what to do and wanted another company and I took two of my three children to a ranch in Montana in the summer. My husband was back working on research for his job or something like that. And um, my middle son wanted me to learn how to ride better. All I knew how to do on a horse was just walk. So I took a lesson. I got up on a horse called Rooster that I had to mount with steps. He was so large. And I was sitting there waiting for the lesson. And the teenager doing the lesson um, hit the other horse next to me. And that horse didn't go anywhere, but Rooster sure did. And he started galloping and threw me over. And I ended up in a hospital wow. in Bozeman, Montana. And they needed to get in touch with my primary care physician. And they could not get through. The front desk kept cutting them off. My husband went over there and stood there and tried. The nurse couldn't reach the doc. It was just a fiasco. And I stayed in the hallway because they wouldn't admit me to the hospital until they could get in touch with my doctor. And so I'm lying there and I'm in a lot of pain, but I'm thinking, what is wrong with this picture? I mean, I've got my attorney on speed dial at that point, my financial planner. I had a cell phone. I could not get through to my doctor. So at that point, I started researching better customer service in healthcare. And it was just, I was in the right place at the right time because concierge was just a concept that was beginning to take off. So I launched that with a consultant and one doctor. We started with 40 members. And when I left Partner MD, we had almost 10,000 members, 13 wow. locations, 30 some physicians coast to coast. So it was quite a ride. Um, and how long, how long did it take to build to that level? I started in 2002, sold the company in 11 and stayed on till 15. Wow. So, that's yeah. quite a ride. Uh, it was really, really interesting and fun. And um, I learned a lot. So what I'm trying to do with Welcome is take what I learned and do it even better. So it's interesting. So it sounds like because of the background coming from the entrepreneurial family that you came from, you, you probably had a pretty good feel early on that you were going to do things on your own. But was there a moment when you knew I'm really going to start this, the, the first business that you started? There actually was. You asked some great questions. So it was a teacher work day and I went to lunch with um, my friends, one of whom was the debate coach. The other guy was the drama coach and I was the journalism person and we were all we got really close because we were always there after all the other teachers left we were there we took our kids to things we were there nights weekends really passionate and it was a really slow server and we got back 10 minutes late from the work day there were no meetings we were just supposed to work in our rooms and an assistant principal met us with a little slip saying he was going to write us up and put this in our permanent personnel record because we were 10 minutes late from lunch so that I, I went to the principal and I said, wait a minute, this, this, we didn't do this on purpose. We really need to figure this out. Um, cl clearly, I need to get this off my record. And he said, 
you know, I wish I could, but it's a bureaucracy. I can't go against him. And he said, I think if you don't like stuff like this, you're, you've just won awards, you're a great teacher, but you really shouldn't be a teacher. And I said, you're right. So wow. I went out and started a business and he's a sweet man. I'll never forget it. He really helped me. But when I gave notice, he forgot that. And he was like, why are you giving notice? I said, well, you told me I should look for something else. He's like, I didn't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> but wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. The, the, you know, there's just sometimes in life, there's those aha moments where you yeah. just know that it's time to make you, a change. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that I found is that there usually is a single moment. People know that they want to do something, but then there's just always something that clicks where they're like, and I think that that's true, not just of entrepreneurship, but of anything, deciding yes. to go back to school or deciding to take a lesson and a skill that you know nothing about. I think that there's always an aha moment. And just being aware of those moments, being an integrated enough in your own personality that you can sense them when they come. That's the, the art of it, I think. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. So what was the hardest part of being on your own on, on the first one? I think the hardest part was just not having company. Being the CEO is lonely. And when you're a teacher or a journalist, you have a lot of colleagues you can talk to. They're all at your same level. It's very different. So I think just lonely and not having, I didn't really have a female mentor. Um, my dad was my mentor but he was all the way across the country. So I think that I, was I could, the yeah, I could part. see where that's tough. And I want to, I want to talk a little bit about that in, in a later, in, in later in the interview for sure, because I think that female mentorship is you and I have spoken about it on our calls mm -hmm. before, but I think that's something that's, that is really important. Um, but, but again, mm -hmm. we'll talk about that in a little bit. If, if you could rewind to the beginning of your career and give younger Linda some advice or just a lesson that you've learned along the way that you wish you had gotten at the beginning, what, what would that be? You know, I was thinking about that. I don't think I've ever been asked that question. So um, you gave me some of these in advance. And one of the things, the biggest thing I think would be not to take things quite so seriously. I think you're so young and idealistic and for me, I was much more sensitive when I was a young CEO. So if somebody didn't like something I did or didn't like something about the way I was running things, I just took it so to heart, I would get terribly distracted. And as I've matured into the role, I realized that you're never going to please everybody all the time. And you have to have enough self-confidence not to second guess yourself. People are always going to find fault with someone in a leadership position a little bit at the time. And once I sort of gave myself a free pass on that, because I'll never be the type of person that's like, oh, someone's upset, I don't care, but just lightened up a little bit, I think I became a much better leader actually. I think that's great advice. And would that be the same thing you would tell a would-be entrepreneur? Or do you think you have other advice for, for someone, someone else besides young Linda? <laughs> um, I think for would-be entrepreneurs, the biggest thing there, and I, I do consulting. I work with amazing, mostly women, but a group of people trying to bring their business to the next level. I don't really advertise it, but when people find me, I do that part-time and, and love it. And I find a theme among my clients. They're super passionate about what they do. They're really good at it, but they don't necessarily trust themselves to delegate too much. They're so passionate. They're afraid to really give real responsibilities to other people and step back enough because they've got, the, they're all in on red seven kind of thing with <laughs> all, their, all their personal and financial resources, but you've got to do that. You can never become a truly successful entrepreneur unless you build an amazing team and then step back and let other people help you grow and in some cases grow better than you could as a as a human being I, I think that's great advice and i think that's really hard for a lot of people especially if they're yeah. used to being an individual contributor maybe a bit of a perfectionist which has served them very mm -hmm. well but it, mm -hmm. it takes way more than any one individual can can it contribute does. to make it successful it definitely does 
So do you invest in other people's companies or, or only in your own? A lot of entrepreneurs only invest in their own because they've got so many great ideas and they control that the best. But how, how, how about for you? I definitely invest in my own, but um, I do invest in other people's companies. I've taken a somewhat unusual tack. A lot of times when I'm consulting with someone, if I really get to know them and work with them, I will invest in their companies because A, I know that they're not at the level of sophistication where they can go out and raise a million dollars from private equity or venture capital, and B, I really know their personalities and, and their integrity. So I have a much higher comfort level and I understand their business because I've been in it trying to help them. So those are, those are really the small ones that I invest in. Okay. That's great. I'm, I'm in a similar boat. A lot of the things that I've invested in are companies that either formally or informally have brought me on as an advisor or, or a consultant. And if I like mm -hmm. them and they're raising money and I think I can add value, then, then, then I'll, I will invest in them. What's the biggest mistake you see founders make when they're raising money? I think there are two things. One is your financials are too rosy. And that's great. And people want to sign up. But then a year later, they're like, why haven't you achieved this? So always, always, always back them down. And the second thing, I think, is not going with your intuition when it comes to investors. One example is I raised a, a lot of money on the first round for Welcome, mostly just with people in Richmond that knew me, knew my reputation, felt good about me doing this again. But one of them was a client of mine who was kind of a challenging client and he had never invested in anything like this. And after our first board meeting, I, he, he, asked, he asked all the questions. He asked them in a very challenging way and he asked a level of specificity that none of us could possibly maintain. He, he wanted to know how every I was dotted and every T was crossed in the marketing plan and why we had changed one thing in the last month. And so I called him up and very nicely said, you know what, this isn't a good fit. I'm going to buy you right back out. <laughs> he was kind of speechless, but I said, I like you. We have a good relationship. Let's keep it that way. I'll write you a check tomorrow. Now I'm lucky enough to be able to do that, to yeah. have the resources, but it was really interesting two of the people on my team, it was 100K, so I was ready to do the whole thing, but two of the people on my team put in 25 each because they were so excited to get rid of this guy. Wow. So, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good I, sign. <laughs> and they wanted to invest, so that was kind of cool too. I really, uh, it, but it, you know, you have to, if I had kept up with that, it would have been so distracting and the other investors who just really wanted to contribute and kind of know what was going on, but not micromanage would have just been rolled over basically. Yeah, that, that's great advice. When someone's not a good fit, whether it's an employee, a partner or an investor, you have to get them out of there. And that's why I think it's really important to have buy sell agreements in your operating yes. agreement and in your equity plans to where, Hey, if this doesn't work out, I'm not forced to keep you on as a partner, but I also, contractually know what I have to do to make you whole. At, That's as a, right. As a result. That's right. So how do you know when it's time to exit a business? Obviously you've done it three times and under slightly different circumstances, it sounds mm -hmm. like in each mm -hmm. one, but how do you, is it something that you're always thinking about or is it just something that's obvious when, when, when you get there or can you maybe speak to that process? Well, I wasn't thinking about it at all. My first time I really wasn't in some some broker just kept calling me and I finally took his call and I realized that the time was right in the childcare business. Staffing was getting increasingly difficult to get quality staff. Um, and I sort of saw some trends before a lot of other folks did. So it was the absolute peak time to, to sell that business. But with partner MD, it was more that I saw that the industry was evolving. It was going from sort of a sketchy, what are these doctors doing in 2002 to this is a real thing. It's here to stay. It's a part of our society. And private equity was looking for a platform and there weren't a lot of platforms out there. And so I felt like the time was absolutely perfect 
to, um, to let it go to the next level. I had grown it, but you can only grow it so quickly organically. And it was really an opportunity and a treat to be able to grow it much faster once um, Markel Corporation purchased us. That's great. So what's easier about launching businesses after the first one? The first successful um, one. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot, actually. I really thought about that. I guess just that you know you can do it, um, that you've done it before and you've kind of been there, done that. You, there's always new things, but you, you know you can do it. That's the only thing I would say is easier. I think what's harder is that there's a harder legal environment. People are harder to get in touch with and connect with now because we're all so busy. There's more distraction, more noise, um, more competition. So I do think each one has been a little harder than the others, but um, a, good, a good challenge. Because you're taking on more challenging problems, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's just always something... It's, it's very hard to succeed in starting something from scratch. That's why the numbers are so low on things that actually get started from scratch and become successful. Got it. So I'm, I've been chastised by a few of my female friends, uh, especially, but some males too, for not having enough females on my podcast. Uh, it's a fair criticism to be sure, but realistically, there certainly are fewer women entrepreneurs, and, and especially in tech where I tend to, to play the most. Why do you think it is that women are underrepresented as founders? Um, I think they're underrepresented because there are a lot of female-owned businesses that never get much bigger than that one or two person business, that thing I was alluding to before of not wanting to grow or not having the confidence to grow and delegate and get larger. I also think, and this has been studied, I can, I can put that study in, in too, but mm -hmm. um, private equity venture capital only gives 15% of its money to female founders. And there are proportionally way more than 50, that 50% 50 of female founders. And it's been studied. Um, it's partly perceptions, but even just the conversation has been studied. So when private equity folks who are largely male are asking males things, they tend to ask big picture strategic type, types of questions. Uh. When they ask females questions, it's more operational, detailed, more looking at it in, in a different way, which makes it harder kind of to make your case. And um, I also think that females don't have mentors to realize that you really can grow to something big and you can raise money and you can, but it's a lot of confidence. And to have confidence, you need training and you need mentors and you need people that have done it that you can depend on. So what are your thoughts on what we as a society can do to, to start to fix this? I mean, that sounds like a very deeply embedded psychological thing where like, I'm going to ask you operational questions just because you're yeah, a female. There's, yeah. there's it's, something It's not deep. intentional, yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the more training boot camps type thing for women that are out there, there are some amazing groups that take you through these, these camps about um, throwing every question at you and how to turn it around. I think that's really important. I think overall in society, trying harder to get more women on corporate boards and public companies so that they're really contributing to the national conversation about things. And I think grant money and, and companies, larger companies, really taking entrepreneurial departments and letting women sort of be entrepreneurial within a larger company and kind of learn those skills with some support and then they can go off and, and kind of learn how to do it themselves. That's great. I've seen quite a few programs along those lines. I've seen mm -hmm. Project Scientist charity events and things where they're just trying to encourage younger girls to get into coding mm -hmm. to begin with. And in the tech world, a big part of the problem seems to be 
for whatever reason, society has long discouraged women from going into engineering. And, and Absolutely. So it's great to see these things like Project Scientists, where these girls are going off at the age of sometimes nine and 10 years old mm-hmm. and building things and, and, and then showing off what they've, what they've built at the events is really cool. Oh, yeah. I always joke, but it's really true. When I was a kid, I really wanted a chemistry set and I just kept getting a Barbie dream house. I got like three Barbie dream houses every Christmas. I never got that chemistry set. (laughs) So it's okay. I'm not mad, but it's just that subtle kind of... um, It's just the encouragement. Yeah. 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 In the wrong way, really. Absolutely. Um. What can investors and entrepreneurs do in your mind, short of some of these longer tail type of things that we're talking about here? But what are, do you think there are any kind of just mindsets that investors and entrepreneurs should have to help to help um, rectify this? Because obviously there's a lot of opportunity if we're missing investing mm-hmm. in and starting companies from a you know a big a half the population that right. that you know there's got to be some opportunities for investors and entrepreneurs to uncover. Well, I think part of it has to do with those of us that are successful, really consciously mentoring people. I try, even when I'm super busy, if someone reaches out to me and wants to have coffee, get on a call, go to lunch, I really try to do it, even though I know there's nothing, quote, in it for me. Mm -hmm. And then I try to connect those people with a source of funding or someone in the community that could really help them. I try to be that kind of connector. And I think if more of the women in those positions, once they've made it, so to speak, really take it seriously to give back, that will help. And I also think that investors need these wonderful um, incubators that are really, I think they need, and there probably are some, there's none in my community per se, but focused on women entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. with women advisors. And there are a couple of funds in Richmond that are looking to invest in women run companies, but there is a lot of power in, in women's wealth. It's not as great as men's wealth, but it can certainly launch some companies. And I think I've spoken at wonderful conferences about this and the more people get together and think about it, the more it's going to happen. And, and we need legislative help too. Like the last conference I went to, our two representatives from Virginia, Abby Spanberger and Elaine Luria, were talking about what they're doing to promote women entrepreneurs in Virginia. So the more we can get help there, the better. Yeah, it's interesting because you and I have a mutual friend in Will Loving. Uh, mm-hmm. He invested in my firm level. And one of the first things he told us was that we were too white and too male on our website. <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> and then we'd better do it. And, and he's white and male too. Yeah. So, uh, and we'd better <laughs> Not, do a better No fault there. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but, but he was right. He said we needed to do a better job of hiring and promoting both. And his point was if we got to 100 people and we were all white and we were all male, uh, it would be impossible to attract women and minorities, and you're just shutting off a very wide um, part of the talent pool. And uh, luckily, we had time to fix that, but I worry that many companies and industries are really far down the path. So it is something uh-huh. that I think it needs an all-of-the-above approach, like what you're talking about. It isn't, can't only be the will-lovings of the world who kind of shake, you know, shake the founders around a little bit and say, hey, we need to fix this together. Mm-hmm. And I think once you get women in your company, and minorities asking them, getting Mm -hmm. them to be part of the solution. I go to a private equity healthcare summit every year. And the first two years, I think there were 80 guys and me. And finally they started saying, well, what do we need to do to attract more women? I said, well, this is great, but maybe like don't race cars the whole (laughs) time. And you know, have a beer thing where everyone screams and, and yeah. to do a few things that might attract um, a more diverse clientele. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we hired a consultant to help us with our strategy for, for hiring on the, on the diversity and inclusiveness front. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I relayed to him, we, in college recruiting, I said that I wanted to have five minority candidates and we only got two and those two had accepted offers with Microsoft. 
Mm. And he said, well, let's take a step back, John. What schools did you recruit at? And I said, Duke, UNC, UVA, Virginia Tech. He's like, huh, you didn't find, and you, and you found mostly white candidates. Did you think about any of the historically black universities? And it was something as simple as that, just changing where you're looking and mm-hmm. what your messaging is. And, and he, he pointed out like you just did. And once you hire a couple of these people, get them in front of the recruiting efforts next year when you go back to college recruiting. Right. And that's how you really start to, to build that. But then you've got to, that's the diversity part. And then there's the inclusiveness. How do you make sure everybody that you're bringing in isn't just there, but they're part of driving the company and, and, and have their voice heard as well? Yeah, it's it's complicated stuff, but it's great that you're thinking about it. Um, so I'd like to shift gears again and just talk about what's different in how you run your business today versus how you maybe did prior to the pandemic. Well, <laughs> every moment changes, it feels like, with this pandemic. Um, I've stayed a lot closer to the operations side. I'm always pretty close to it, but I have almost daily, sometimes three times a day check-ins with my practice manager who oversees both offices. I talk to my partner and medical director um, several times a week. We usually have a long call on the weekends and I want to stay really close to how people are feeling. I started getting a whole bunch of different metrics that I would look at once a month, but now I'm looking at them once a week, like how many visits are we having, virtual or not, how many, um, how much insurance revenue are we getting, how many new members are coming in from the general public, what are old members saying about renewals? And so, so are these are these the same KPIs that you would have checked before? You're just checking them more frequently, or did the actual what you? What they're the same change? KPIs, but I, that's a great question. But I check them more frequently. But I'm also asking a lot of questions that the KPIs might not say, like mm-hmm. how are what's the feedback we're getting? We've been doing a lot of communications with our patients, more than a lot of our competition. Um, I've been helping write them and our marketing guy who's wonderful has done a fantastic job, but we're what they don't tell me until I ask, and now I'm hearing is that they're getting a lot of feedback from their customers, the doctors, the practice manager, the nurses. I really learned something. I'm so excited to get this. I asked each doctor to write just a heartfelt letter to each of his or her patients, just saying what was in their heart about this virus and the responses to that, the texts and the messages and the, the outpouring of feelings has just been amazing. So I'm trying to both look at more frequent KPIs so I can make quick decisions, but I'm also trying to really understand what our patients are feeling and thinking and what our workers are thinking and feeling. I mean, sometimes uh, I had a conversation with someone in my company and I asked, how are you doing? He's like, I'm okay. And I just said, Let's talk. What's going on? Why we're all stressed? What's stressing you? But just we're and we're having to do it on the phone more than we would by walking around and sitting mm-hmm. in someone's office and looking at their body language. So, really listening to how someone's voice sounds and the the sort of way they're talking is really important because then you can connect and maybe reassure them or give them something that will help them or somehow help them through this terrible time, which I think is, is super important to keep everyone's morale up. Because we all feel, I'm working harder than ever just with everything that's here, applying for the SBA loans and the disaster relief, and there's a Medicare thing out there, and it's just one thing after another, and you're running your business, and we're making decisions all the time about testing and when yeah. we had our first COVID patient, we had to retest everyone in the office or get everyone tested. And that was a big decision. I mean, there's just something all the time. Well, and, and everybody working as a human. And in, in addition to all the stresses mm-hmm. from the work, they're stressed for their own safety, the safety of Absolutely. their family members. If they've got anybody who's immunocompromised in their household, that layers on the stress too. I think that empathy is, is key in any business mm-hmm. during any time, but it's even more important during, an, during a pandemic for sure. Yes. 
So, so you mentioned you have some experience with COVID. Can you speak a little bit to what, what your practice has, has seen around COVID? You mentioned that you had a COVID patient. How many have you seen that type of thing? We have had two at this point. We've done a lot of tests, um, but only two that tested positive. What we have noticed in the practice is our call volume has increased tremendously. We're getting so many calls from patients who are just panicked. They may have allergies and they're convinced they have COVID or they think a family member has it or they just are so stressed they're beginning to feel the symptoms, which is a very legitimate kind of thing. Um, so that communication, being there for them at night, on the weekends, taking phone calls when they're stressed, I think is really, really important. Um, but having the tests and being able to answer their questions that way. But then the other thing we've noticed in the practice is that we're able to help on a whole nother level. So for example, we had a woman get a really bad dog bite last week and everyone was like, she can't go to the emergency room. We, we've got to handle it here and not send her to the emergency room. So we took care of it, but then we got our team researching how, I guess there's a, a, something that you need after the dog bite that's hard to find and you need it at certain pharmacies and not all of them had it and many of them were closed. And so we did all that research and got her to get that and then checked on her constantly so she didn't have to go to the emergency room. So it's things like that that I think we're dealing with all the time in a different way. We might have just said, gosh, I think you probably should go to the ER and we'll, we'll call over there and we'll, we'll keep checking on you. But this time it was like, if we can handle it, we're handling it. Um, that's great. So that's one example, but it's really changed how we're, we're doing medicine. Plus we have a HIPAA compliant, wonderfully easy telemedicine system. So whenever possible, we're doing virtual visits, but sometimes people just need to be seen. You can't fix, clean up a dog bite over a computer. They sure. just have to come in. <laughs> so how prepared was Welcome MD for the pandemic and what unique factors of concierge medicine may have let you be more prepared than you might have been otherwise? Well, I don't think anyone was prepared actually for the pandemic, but as we began to hear about it in China, we had meetings and talked about what we could do. Our medical director has a wonderful um, ability to sort of see into the future and and we work together on this but i think the reason we've done so much better than a lot of other companies or practices is it's like in anything when you're small when the decision makers are there when you can really make a quick decision and act on it you're going to get results a little bit quicker. It's nothing about our doctors being any better. It's nothing about us being any smarter. It's just the- You're um, nimble, yeah. The nimbleness around that. And so we worked really, really hard to, to get the tests, to sort of start, we screen people at the curb, we do the tests in the car, we have a number of procedures that we do. And then we just worked really hard immediately to start calling people and we prioritize calling our elderly first, calling our immunocompromised first, even if they didn't call us, just how are you doing? Do you have someone to get groceries? Do you have a plan for this? Do you have a pulse ox, which a lot of people don't know about, but if you have COVID and it gets difficult, it measures your blood oxygen level. And we got some of those and are giving them at cost to our patients because you can't get them on the internet anymore. So it's things like that, trying to really think a few steps ahead, where the shortages are going to be and how can we help. We have Chinese investors and um, I asked them for masks and the masks just arrived today. And we had some before, but these are really nice. 300 of them and they'll get us through for a while so oh, that's great yeah were, were, were there any policies that you implemented on either the medical or the business side when when things started to really heat up and you knew that this obviously your your medical director gave you some heads up but there mm -hmm. i'm assuming there was a point where you said okay now we're in the bad part but were, were there any policies you you implemented 
just being sure that people didn't come in frivolously, sort of getting screened outside, but screened over the phone. And then in terms of business, and I did this in 2009 as well, but it's more challenging now. Whenever anyone feels they can't pay, instead of just saying, okay, see you, we try to talk about it, we try to work with them, try to give them um, discounts or you know, a so you mentioned order. 09 you mentioned 09 because of the challenging economic times or was right. there also an outbreak because I remember was there an outbreak in 08 or 09 of some sort uh, there was but, but it was you're the talking challenging more about the recession. economic yeah. times <laughs> and I feel like business wise if you really work with people um, they really want to stay your customer they don't want to change doctors in this kind of a difficult environment and not being all about the money, but being all about your patience, I think is the most important thing and kind of letting everyone there know that that's what, what we're concerned about is making sure that our patients stay in the environment where they are and, and we're gonna do everything we can to help them. We haven't, knock on wood, had uh, much in terms of people dropping out at this point, but a couple people are very nervous and we've reassured them we'll work with them, which I think is important. That's great. So are the SBA loans, or are there any programs that are, you mentioned a Medicaid program, are, are there programs that are directed from the federal level to assist those type yes. of patients? Okay. Um, well, the SBA loan is for every small business, um, mm -hmm. I think with 500 or less, the payroll protection. Mm -hmm. And then we just found out Friday that there's a program from Medicare that takes just automatically how much you bill Medicare and gives you some relief on that. But a lot of companies got theirs and we didn't. So today we're looking to see where it is and how we can get it. And, you know, it's out there and we want, we want to get our fair share just like everyone else. So it's, sure. it's looking at things in a, in a different way because I don't think any of us know how long this is going to go on. None of us have lived through it and we don't know how many waves of things are going to befall us. So yeah, I wanted to ask you about yeah. that from a business standpoint, do you think there will be multiple waves until we have herd immunity or a vaccine or it sounds like nobody really has a, a read on that? No, I've talked to a couple of doctors, um, recently one guy's brilliant he works part-time in the emergency room and is also a concierge doctor and he said he's on calls all the time and he thinks that we'll kind of open back up for a couple of months in the summer but then when the fall and the colder weather start we'll get careless and we'll have a whole nother wave of this who mm -hmm. knows but i think as business people and as human beings we have to kind of steal ourselves that this could happen and not just think, oh gosh, I can eat in a restaurant again. I can go to a party and think, well, it's not going to come back. It might. And the point is, as business people, our major responsibility is to keep our employees, keep our business, keep what we have until this goes away. Yep. I think that's great advice. So I think we already covered this a little bit, but do you have any other advice for people in terms of taking care of their health and, in, in, you know, during the pandemic? Um, you already mentioned continuing to exercise, getting out, uh, consuming yeah. good content, all, all the things that people should be doing anyways. I think really thinking of creative ways to interact with people is really, really important because I think that's something that is hard, especially if you're introverted or you don't, you know, always love to seek out other human beings, sort of forcing yourself to find ways to interact, even if it's a six feet away walk with someone or some of our friends play um, Scattergories on Zoom, which is a ridiculous, funny game and had some wine. And it was just a lot of fun to see them and laugh and not think about all this. Finding interesting, unique ways. Another friend has organized some kind of Zoom dance party, which I think might be odd, but we're going to go. You know, just whatever people can do to keep their social connections. And, and it really does help to see people versus just talking on the phone. 
Amaya, a seven-year-old, I, I didn't realize what was going on. He started playing Fortnite a lot more lately. And I sat in his room and I watched him play. And I realized it's the ultimate way to be social for, for someone of his age because he's got headphones on and he's talking and they're there in your headphones, not just on a phone. Yeah. But you're actually yeah. engaging and solving a problem together as well. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and it's, it's become his favorite game again, even though he had started to kind of wean himself off of it about a year ago. And, and That's so I think cool. those type of things are awesome. Yeah. 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 Because I think it's like anything else. You wake up in the middle of the night, there's nobody to talk to, and you get a lot more anxious than when there's a lot going on, even if it's on your, on your Zoom, than yep. just sitting there going, well, what if, what if, what if kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, if someone thinks they have come into contact with COVID, what, what should they do? I mean, do they... The first thing they should do is call their doctor. Mm -hmm. Um, It's hard to go straight to the state healthcare office because they will always refer you to a doctor. If you don't have a primary care, go to urgent care and ask them. Um, Some of these places have tests or they can refer you for a test and talk to the doctor about what they should do. I think that's the most important thing. And and be your own advocate because there's, I've seen so many instances where people really don't feel well, but they're talked out of getting tested. And I think the testing is important. It tells us how many people have it. It changes behaviors. Even if you isolate, if you know you have it, you're going to get retested and it's safer. I think to be an advocate, to get the test, maybe not if you don't have symptoms, but if you truly do have some of the symptoms, you may just have to push to get it, but they are out there. Great. Well, th- this, this has been fantastic. And as I mentioned before, we're going to open it up for a live Q&A session. We do have already three or four really good questions. So Great. I'll go ahead and, and, and ask some of you. These all seem to be much more geared towards you, not surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> So we have from Mark Jones, where do you see traditional medicine going in the future compared to a group like Welcome MD? How much of Welcome MD's work is preventative? Which I think you talked a little bit to the second one, but do you, Mm -hmm. you you mentioned that when you started this, people were looking at this kind of medicine as a little bit kooky, or you used a term like that. Are you influencing more traditional medical practitioners, do you think? And are they starting to adopt more of your approach? Well, I think the whole movement for functional medicine and anti-aging is changing all the way across the country. It's really tough for primary care physicians, not because they're not interested, because they just don't have time when they see a typical primary care has maybe 3,000 patients versus 300, and they see sometimes um, 18, 20, 24 people a day. So 10 minute appointments, boom, boom, boom. It's really hard to get deep into it. What we try to do is we're putting an element of DNA science into it. So every member does a DNA fitness and nutrition test where you look at how your, your genes respond to carbohydrates, to salt, to um, different types of foods, how your recovery process works when you work out. Are you the type of person who can work out every day or should you take rests in between? Are you a sprinter or a long distance runner? It measures your sleep habits, which is super important in terms of health, getting enough sleep and different types of stress. And it's a one-time thing. Your DNA is not going to change, but knowing what it is, then you can build routines around it. There really is such a thing as the fat gene. And it doesn't mean people can't lose weight, but it means that they're not so hard on themselves when they know that they have to work a lot harder at it because they come from a Northern land where it's just really easy to store fat versus some of us who come from different different types of genetic um, areas. Sure. No, that's great. And I know there's obviously online tests that you can take, but I, I pride myself on being pretty geeky and into this stuff. And I find interpreting SNPs to be nearly impossible. So knowing that there's yeah. smart doctors like on your staff who can help you wade through that seems to be very helpful. Well, everybody who takes it, every member or corporate person gets at least an hour with the doctor going over it. And then 
an hour with the exercise physiologist, nutritionist, and health coach to really put it into perspective um, because it, it, you get this big book and it's really interesting, but it's kind of overwhelming and it, it works better when you, when you can work with someone on it rather than in a vacuum. Oh, for sure. Um, before I ask the next couple ones, just for anybody listening, if you, if you want to ask a question, there is a and a button that you can press. Um, if you're having trouble finding that, you can also press the chat button. But the Q&A button across the bottom of the Zoom screen is how you can, can ask the question. Um, so now from an anonymous attendee, we have, why would a physician want to be part of a concierge model? <laughs> That's a great, great question. Um, <laughs> Many physicians really want to be part of it, partly because they're seeing now 24 people a day and the hamster wheel medicine. I think physicians, especially primary care, you go into it because you really like people. You don't go into it for, for the big bucks, um, pediatrics or primary care. That's for the surgeons and the cardiologists and that type of thing. But they really care about people and you can't educate or change people's behaviors unless you have time. So to me, that's the biggest reason. It's a lifestyle thing and you really can have some family time and put a few boundaries. You're on call, but it's nothing like being in a huge practice where when you're on call, you're up all night taking um, dozens of calls. And it's also just a satisfaction of being able to learn and help and feel like you're more in charge of your practice. Our doctors all have equity in our company and so they, in, in their particular practice, so they feel like they're growing it right along with us and our job is to give them the marketing and the support and the business side so they can grow this the way they see fit. I guess the challenge for you is that as they get, as you grow the business, you've got to maintain, you know, to keep attracting those great doctors, you've, you've got to keep their numbers down in that 300 range. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're incentivized to grow the business like anybody is, yes. but then that creates more challenges because you've got to find other great doctors. But it sounds like if you do a good job with that, you're going it, to, it's a virtuous snow, snowball effect where more and more yeah. great doctors want to be around other great doctors. We reject more doctors than we pick because okay. it takes a really particular personality to do this. And um, we are just so lucky in the, the people that we have picked. I would much rather pass on someone than go with someone who's the wrong fit. It's like anything in your business too. You spend all the time dealing with someone who doesn't work when the people that do work just do such a superb job, it's such a pleasure to work with them. Yep, absolutely. So we've got another great question from Richard Brown. Um, if a physician were planning to begin a concierge practice in the near future, how long should he or she wait in light of the pandemic? I.e., how long would you guess it would take for patients to become members given the pandemic? You know, I'm on a private equity board and right after the pandemic, we had a call and they have maybe, I don't know, 150 concierge clients. They're more of a consulting company that helps stocks do that. And they said, this is great. Everyone wants to sign up now. It's going to be great for our industry. Of course, you would never want that ever, but, um, we found a little of that, and I know that people really do want to sign up, but I think there's also just the frozen factor that so much is going on, people just can't seem to make any decisions. It sounds good, but to decide anything right now seems difficult. So if I were a doctor thinking about doing this on my own, A, I'd either partner with somebody like us who has the financial wherewithal to help through an uncertain time, or I'd wait a little while to just sort of see how this all shakes out. Because although it's wonderful to have the partners and we are getting, we had an unprecedented number in Charlotte sign up just last, at the end of last month when all this was happening, because I talked to one guy in particular who wanted just to talk to me. And he said, I'd been thinking about doing this for 10 years. And it was the 
the COVID that pushed me over the edge. I've got three risk factors. And my wife said, well, you've been talking about it for 10 years. You might as wow. well just go ahead and do it. And yeah. so he and his wife signed up, but not everybody is in that boat. So my whole thing when there's something this uncertain is take your time, go slow. Yeah. But I do think the world will return to normal, some kind of new normal. And people, I think, will think about their health in a way they didn't before. And that, I think, will be good for, for our industry. I, I agree. I'm very hopeful that people are going to change um, some of their behavior, especially towards, towards health, but hopefully socially and, and some other decisions that we make in our mm -hmm. lives. And, th and that relates to our fourth question, which is from an anonymous attendee. Knowing what you know now in this pandemic, what would you change about how you would run a future business? Oh, that is a great question. Whoever asked that, that was a fantastic question. Um, I, I mean, I think my, I mean, I'll take a stab at it from my Take a stab while yeah. I think and have a sip of water. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that this shows that I think companies that have a digital experience ready for their customers, companies who can interact over Zoom or can interact through an app or who can interact through telemedicine, generally are going to do better, I think, in, in a pandemic. And there, you can imagine other scenarios where mm -hmm. being able to touch, I, I'm not saying that we need to get away from the human touch, but I do think that that digital interaction point, this really highlights how important that capability is for businesses. So I would look for businesses to, to put that digital strategy front and center, no matter what business they're in. Well, I think that is it in a nutshell. We were so lucky to have, or it was partly forethought, but definitely luck to have put that Doxy Me um, app, which is easy to use and HIPAA compliant, trained everyone, gotten it up and running with our IT company before this happened. And we were also in the process of looking for virtual memberships because there are a lot of people in rural areas that aren't in the Charlotte or the Richmond metro area that really need this kind of help. And we're finding some great interest in maybe coming in when you can for the physical experience, but everything else virtual, the follow-ups, everything. We can have virtual labs come to them to get the data. Um, there's so much that you can do virtually if you're not in an area where you can access the doctors physically. So we were already thinking about this, but I think, I think all of us, as we look at businesses in the future, will think what happens if this happens again? I don't think any of us will ever forget it. I, I agree. It's so, some things just are so pervasive that they change the mindset more than through one new cycle. And this certainly feels more like that than any other event that I've lived through in business for sure. And you're, you're so nice and young, but my parents would always talk about being kids in the great depression. And mm -hmm. that's a perfect analogy that changed them forever. I mean, yep. they were referring to it back in the seventies um, yeah. because it just made such a, a, such an impression on them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, well, this has been wonderful. I think that's all the questions that we had. Linda, I thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. This was very valuable to me. I, as I mentioned, for those of you who may have joined late and didn't get to hear the whole thing, I'm going to publish this on my, on my podcast platform. That's the Defiance Ventures podcast. It'll be available for download. I've got the Defiance Ventures YouTube channel. I'll publish that as well. Um, this has been, been great for me and hopefully for the listeners as well. And thank you so much, Linda. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. All right. Take, take care. care. All right. Bye-bye.